team at Acton Software, and we're very Welcome to today's live webinar titled, Using Data and Design to Create a Knockout Email Nurture Program. Today's program is sponsored and presented to you by Acton Software. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to your presenter, Ms. Rachel Rosman. Please go ahead. Hello and welcome to today's presentation. Uh, my name is Rachel Rosden, the Marketing Specialist for the Demand Gen team at Acton Software, and we're very excited to present today's topic, which is using data and design to create a knockout email nurture program. Before we begin, I'll do, uh, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Lorman Education for the opportunity to present today. Uh, we're always happy to be here, and we love the Lorman audience. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot of information, so we welcome any questions at any time during the presentation. Just feel free to enter your questions in the interface, and uh, we're going to be answering all of the questions at the end of the presentation. So we're going to get to as many as we can. Um, and uh, I know everybody's favorite question is, and it's already been mentioned, is, is this session being recorded? And the answer is yes, it is. Um, everybody is going to have access to the recording and the slide deck. So we'll be sending those files out via email. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox in the next couple of days. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's uh, main presenter. We are being joined by Aaron Bolshaw, the Group Manager of Database Marketing on the Demand Gen team at Acton Software. Aaron has extensive experience in demand generation marketing, working with big brands, uh, Fortune 500, and various startup companies in both the B2C and the B2C marketing functions. Uh, Aaron has directed email, demand generation, and inside sales operations for over 10 years and has used an experience in marketing automation over the last four plus years to power up the demand generation operations for two technology startup companies. So he has a lot of experience on today's topic, and we're excited to get going. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so uh, we do have a lot to, to discuss today, and it's, it's really timely. You know, we're turning the year. It's 2015 now, and we've got sort of that fresh slate uh, to begin. So uh, to start out, we're going to you know, have some fun polls, I think, going through the presentations to help us you know, all understand where as a group, we are in our email program. So look for those, and please participate. You know, um, The goal, pretty simple. Just give you a better idea of how data and design are really driving better results in what's still considered to be the highest performing ROI of all, our, uh, uh, all of our marketing activities. It's email, right? So some of this is designed to give newer folks sort of a foundational understanding of lead nurturing, you know, building personas or lead profiles, things of that nature. But we do, uh, we'll walk through the differences between batch and blast emails and nurture programs, so uh, that'll be nice. Also, I want to make sure we see some real examples of automated lead nurturing programs to really get you interested in this concept. So, uh, you know, you will come away with some very actionable insights you can actually use in your next email campaigns. If you've got anything going out this week, next week, I want you to pay attention because there's some cool stuff you'll learn, okay? So a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we're looking for, I think it's about an hour today. Uh, and, again, if we get through the presentation or we get through the material in time, it will allow for more Q&A on the back end. So let's, uh, let's get going. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. So, first of all, what uh, marketing presentation uh, would be complete without a few fast facts, right? So, I wanted to start with uh, a couple. First of all, companies that excel at lead nurturing, 50% more sales ready leads at much lower cost. We know this ourselves. Rachel and I live this daily uh, because we do automate our lead nurturing um, and we see the results. And uh, we also see a larger uh, uh, or uh, increased revenue. Uh, Every day, you know, we've uh, been doing this for quite some time now. We obviously use Acton as a platform ourselves, um, so and we continue to outpace our peers um, because of it. And then finally, um, and, and this is interesting because a lot of folks, uh, if you're in B two C, this will make a lot of sense. Nurtured leads actually lead to 47% larger purchases, and that's by the Annuitas Group. And these are, you know, outstanding facts that you can take with you and just kind of uh, uh, chew away at, at your desk as you kind of look to um, either upgrading to uh, 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 the, the next gen MarTech or even in your current platforms. You know, you, what you're doing in email marketing is standout. So really let's start with what nurturing is, okay? Nurturing... Um, you know, one of the realities, first of all, that I think we all live with as marketers is this sort of uncommon grounds for which we, we call our activities. For instance, you know, a campaign to one person really isn't a, what another person would call a campaign. A campaign is, is maybe just an email 
where uh, for another person it's an email and it's some social presence and it's also a form and it's also a webinar, right? So I wanted to give a little color to what we call nurturing. It's the third step in the lead marketing life cycle. And it's generally described here in B2B terms. But uh, starting with attract, that's kind of, if you think about it, that's the content, that's the blogs, that's the white papers and the websites and the forums that are used to help potential customers find you and find your business. Capture is the mechanisms by which those potential customers identify themselves to you. That's the forms. These are those conversion pages, right? Think of surveys, things of those nature, right? Then nurturing is the process of engaging and building a relationship with prospects and customers by providing relevant and timely information on their needs. Okay, we'll get into that just a little bit more, but uh, continuing that, uh, that life cycle, the marketing life cycle, converting is the process of closing business. It's a one deal. It's all the hard work. It pays off to get a customer. And, and you know, make no mistake, there are many smaller conversions that happen through this entire process, but the grandest of them all still continues to be, of course, when you create revenue. So uh, then following that revenue, expand, right? That's actively cultivating customers to either buy more stuff or engage more in your brand or become advocates and help uh, create new leads and new uh, business and revenue downstream. So also, very important, nurturing doesn't just stop after that one point in the life cycle, okay? Marketers, with their heads above the crowd, nurture prospects and customers in a strategic and continuous way. So where batch and blast is sort of this destination, right? The batch and blast where you get uh, a group of uh, uh, prospects and you get an email put together and you send it out. That's kind of like that one point in time. Nurturing is a journey, and it's a journey that um, really can be difficult with just email-only tools. Uh, MarTech is making it a, a lot easier. Um, uh, it's been now five years, I guess, that I've been using marketing automation. Previous to that, I was very much in uh, a batch and blast environment, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself right now. You know, before I want to jump into technology and how kind of to put all the pieces together, we have to talk about the pieces. We have to talk about the campaigns and the content. And to start, we need to talk about the most important ingredient, and that's the people. Okay, so specifically, the, the people I'm talking about, of course, uh, uh, and the processes are those folks that go through um, a process, a buying process, while considering a purchase from your, your company. Okay, putting together these personas and buying processes should be square one for any marketer, no matter what, B2C, B2B, startups, you know, tech companies, any industry, it does not matter. You need to understand who it is that's about to give you money and give you business and become a com uh, customer, okay? So what does that look like? What does this buyer persona thing look like, right? It's, it's as simple as a PowerPoint slide with a picture on it, right? And it's a brief biography including, you know, a, a little bit of the background, uh, the daily activities for this person. Uh, you know, what is their title usually? Uh, what are their current problems and what are the solutions to those problems, right? And what's really just, what's really important? What are the motivators, right? Then the process um, is, is very simple. It's the steps they go through from, uh, ouch, I've got a pain, need identification, right? To after, even after p the purchase. And don't think of this as a vanilla sort of exercise to do. Be very specific with these people, with these personas, okay? Um, if you're not sure what your buyer looks like, or what their process looks like, it is time for a chat with sales. They generally have a lot of touch, uh, high touch with prospects and customers and can help you greatly define who they are and what they do. So um, you're also going to work with them to, of course, define the buying process, you know, what steps they take along their journey. These, your salespeople know, right? You know, is there an RFP? Is there a demonstration? Uh, where do they look for information when encountering pains? Where do they go online, right? Where do they go for the information on solving their pains? Uh, because trust me, you want to be visible there. So uh, we're going to start with a quick poll. Yeah, so our first poll that we have today is, do you have a defined persona identifying your target buyer or buyers? So we're going to go ahead and keep this open for just a couple minutes to see what some of the answers are. You know, the theme of this uh, presentation is using data and design to create nurture, and we are going to get some data on you right now. Um, so it looks like right now we are uh, 
we're kind of all over the board, but we have uh, about 50% of, of our participants today do have an identified buyer persona. Um, we do have about uh, just under 20% of people that do not, and 30% uh, of the people are working on it. So, um, you know, good for everybody that has answered today. Um, we're going to pass this back off to Aaron now to uh, continue with the presentation. Yeah, that's great. And I keep seeing these numbers go up, Rachel, like the ones that are saying, yes, we've got this identified uh, persona, we've got this process in place, because that is, uh, like I said, it's so foundational. So congratulations to everyone that's got it. If you don't and you're working on it, continue to work on it. This is a great thing to do early in the year, but it is so important. It informs everything else that you do including the content side, right? You know, so now that you have an understanding, let's, let's move forward about our target buyer, and you have an idea and an outline of the steps they take before handing you their business, it's time to start building some content to help craft that journey. Uh, so uh, as a quick primer, you know, content, we, we know it, we live it, we love it, uh, but it's the information of value to your prospect, right? Often, these people are willing to exchange their information for it. That's part of the attract capture part, right? So if you've got really great content about a pain or uh, a pain point, they may be willing to say, "Here's my email, here's my phone number, and we know what to do with those things, right?" So, uh, but different. It's important to understand. You know, different content is going to be out more or or less effective depending on the buyer's relationship with your company. Okay, and also their place in the buying journey. So keep that in mind as we move forward here. Uh, you just want to provide very relevant, very timely information. And here's the key. It's based on their needs, right, not ours. Uh, uh, so it's important not to confuse content with uh, public relations or advertising. It's not either of those things. So uh, it, can, it can manifest itself in those outlets, but certainly it is not the, uh, the, uh, the bullhorn. So Here's kind of the, the beginning of a map, okay? So, uh, you know, we've got the people who are buying from you, right? We've identified sort of that process that they've gone through for a purchase, and here we have it on paper, right? Now we want to start building content, but we want to do it in a way that, that leads them along that buying journey. It pulls them through and guides them. It helps them to understand your product and the pain that they have and how the two come together. It's really the new calling card for us as marketers, right? And uh, so in this sample, example, excuse me, you see some, you know, some sort of made-up personas on the left, got an economical, technical influence or executive. These may be some that you use in your own personas right now for the half of you that, uh, that have it. Uh, in the middle, you'll see the content. That's the, the pieces, you know, that we've put together that helps each of those individuals' journeys. Now, voila, this is it. There's the buyer content map. Right For our purposes here, it's a pretty scaled-down version. Ours doesn't quite look like this. It's a little bit longer, uh, certainly more in-depth, but you get the point. Um, you know, it, it, it may very much be more robust for yourselves as well, and especially if you have a longer sales cycle time, this map will get long, okay? Our economic buyer here uh, shown that's the person really we consider they're the ultimate signer and, and approver of that purchase. Um, you know, she begins her journey uh, in understanding how to solve a pain by you know, downloading and reading a white paper that you wrote. Then she, she needs to do some more investigative work, which she can do directly from that handy calculator you've developed and put on your website and also promote via email, right? Then you off, uh, offer her decision supportive material later in the buying journey. When she's getting to the point of purchase, you need to help her make that purchase, and you need to tip the, the scales in your favor, right? So, uh, uh, Rachel, another quick poll. I'd like to get a feel for every, where everyone is at here today. Yeah, so poll number two is now open. It is, do you have a defined content map? So we'll let people go ahead and give a second to answer there. You know, content is always one of our favorite topics here because it, you know, as marketers, lets you be a little bit more creative. So those meetings tend to be a little bit funner than some of the other ones that you have. Um, but looking at uh, our results right now, we are definitely really varied. Uh, we have it about 10% uh, of people do and about 60% of people do not with about 30% of people still working on it. Um, so, you know, it's time to set your 2015 resolutions. Let's get some content maps in place for the people that uh, do not have it yet. So true, so true. And, and you know, that's, those numbers, Rachel, aren't outside of what we normally see. You know, when we talk with our customers, um, uh, there's a lot of 
uh, discussion about, you know, what's the content? What you because these are the pieces that really make what our technology does really come to life, you know, as marketers. And that's about right. You know, uh, there's 15% that are kind of leading the charge. There's a big portion that are working on it still. Uh, so congratulations again to everyone. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, but it is again that foundational step. So. Okay, so I'm just going to show you uh, very quickly, you know, uh, it, it, it's not easy to do, and it's, it, it's even harder to put into play, putting this, you know, the personas and the buyer's map and the content map, excuse me, together. It's not easy. But I wanted to pick up on our conversation again, MarTech. You know, here's a screenshot very quickly of, of the Acton platform, just one uh, that shows how marketers can put all of these things into play all in one spot, right? You see uh, – I don't want to get bogged down in the details, but but ultimately, you know, our, our customers are able to easily define segments based on persona, where they are in their buying cycle, and deliver the perfect piece of content each and every time. You know, this what you're looking at take about three minutes to do, and and while you do it, you can send your IT folks to get coffee. You know, it doesn't take uh, any more uh, effort, or uh, certainly we the, the technology has made it more simple. So now here's the here's the deal though. Here's the rub. Even though we've made considerable process, uh, considerable process, uh, progress, we we still yeah we got the people, we got their journey, we've got the supporting content developed, we've got everything going, and we're just pulling up to the starting line, right? So you have a decision to make. When email is a part of that mechanism or marketing mix where you'll nurture your prospects, do you want to batch and blast, or should you look at automated programs, right? Uh, and very simply. You know, I, I, first let me say, you, you will absolutely be able to nurture prospects using Batch and Blast. But as your pool of prospects grows, as your business expands, and as you start to do possibly more product lines and get more diverse, you start to see each of those prospects at different points along their buyer journey you're going to have a lot of segmenting, a lot of building emails, a lot of testing, a lot of, and ultimately you're going to have a lot of sends to click. You're going to click this, click, 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 send a whole bunch, right? And I've been there. You know, amount, the amount of effort and, and time it took for me to get one email out the door at the Fortune, five com, uh, Fortune 500 company I ran email programs at was astonishing. Marketing automation really changed the game, though, because now you have a choice, right? Marketing automation takes all this great stuff we're talking about, the personas, the buying site, uh, process, the content. It gives you the ability to start a truly meaningful digital discussion with prospects without the need to wear your index finger out pressing that send button. So um, quick note as well uh, for those of you still wondering if all this talk about marketing automation is really worth it. Um, one of the, one of the uh, consistent themes that we see uh, in our own uh, sales cycle and pipeline is that folks that don't decide to go with Acton, uh, generally don't go with any marketing automation at all. And they say it's, it, it's, they're not ready for it or it's not worth it, right? They can't see it. But according to Jupiter Research, not only is it worth it, it pays for itself very quickly. So last poll. All right, Rachel, I got to know. I got to know. Yes, last question of the day. What best describes your use of emails? We have a couple of options here. We got the batch and blasty uh, for the people that just kind of send out your messages, hope you get the right people. Uh, nurture addicts, those who are dedicated to building those nurture programs out. Um, a little bit of both or it's complicated. And I know I've been a part of some marketing teams before and I, I usually fell in the it's complicated uh, uh, realm there. But it looks like we have uh, kind of a clear winner. Uh, we between uh, a little bit of both and the batch and blasty. Uh, we have about five percent of nurture addicts um, and twenty five percent, and it's complicated. But we got between uh, forty and thirty five percent at batch and blasty and a little bit of both. So I think today is definitely going to help everybody. Um, so we can maybe even out these percentages a bit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think so. And, and so for those that are uh, nurture addicts, welcome. We love you. Uh, you're going to get a good view of some things that we're doing here, as well as one of our uh, outstanding customers. Uh, for those that are doing a little bit of both or just doing batch and blasty, here's a great 
thing. Listen in, because this is what you can aspire to be, right? This is sort of that next, that next area of engagement. It's that one-up level of marketing. So first of all, to kind of back it up a bit, I, I just want to outline how Acton uses automated programs. We, we create leads and move them, move them through our sales funnel, right? But we focus on where you're at in your buying cycle, okay? It's all about the funnel. Uh, at the top of the funnel, right? You may not know a lot about Act On. And what you're going to do is we're going to introduce you with lighter content, videos, white papers, maybe this webinar, right? Uh, in the middle, we're going to start offering uh, content spe specific to your persona, and its, aid, its uh, aim is to help aid uh, process for our prospects, right? At the bottom, again, it's all about the decision support of content, post-sale programs, and ongoing customer communications. We want to put, you know, the, the five reasons why marketing automation beats, um, you know, email-only uh, solutions. We want to give ourselves the best chance at closing that business, and we do that by providing really great content there. So what does an automated program look like, right? These, th th it can be very hard to conceptualize. So, uh, yeah, you know, when you get to the point of putting your first automated program together, uh, and a side note, here's my Nostradamus-like prediction. If you're in marketing right now and you plan on being in this field for the next five years, even three, I'd say, it's not a matter of if you're building an automated email program. It is when, right? But uh, when you do get to that point of putting that first one together, you'll want to sketch out a plan. Here's two examples. On the left, very simple linear program. This is all it does, right? You can use send and wait steps. No conditional branching, no behavior tie-ins, nothing fancy. Send an email, wait a few days, then send another one, okay? Um, uh, on the, it, it, it does employ another powerful marketing automation tool on the left, though, which is uh, lead scoring, and it's a beautiful thing. Lead scoring is such a great thing. Um, uh, and so ultimately what happens is uh, on a lead score, when people engage with your content, download white papers, open and click on emails, right? You, they're starting to kind of learn more about you and your brand. Uh, they're going to earn some points. At a certain point threshold, I've got 30 up on the board here. You're going to want to give it to sales. This is a sales-ready lead, right? And from there, they're going to have conversations on the phone and also emails, and they're going to start sort of dissecting who's hot, who's cold, Maybe some become a customer, right? Uh, and, and who are the C-level folks? Well, we, we're able to take the, um, all the parts of the sales and integrate within the automated program. So on the right, much more techy approach, using conditionals, dynamic content, behavior lookups. This is a fun type where you can deliver super relevant content based on what your prospect's prior interests are automatically. Um, so for the uh, folks that answered yes to Nurture Addict before, or for you, those of you that are seriously considering making the jump, here's a few tips from the trenches here uh, from the Demand Gen team uh, at Acton. So one, know what you want to do after the program and build that in. A lot of people build a program and they, they kind of let it sit there and then it gets to the end and they go, oh, wait, I want to do these other things. Well, you can, you can build that into the program. Uh, link programs together when possible. That extends a journey as necessary, right? Uh, consider one-offs versus programming. Here's a great example. Uh, so when you want to tell the world that you've made it on the Inc. 500 uh, for the second year in a row, um, that's not something I'm going to put in a program. I'm not going to put that in an automated program because it's, time, it's not a timeless message, right? I'll use a batch and blast for that. Rachel and I will put together a great uh, email, and we'll put that out uh, uh, as a batch and blast, not, uh, not in an email uh, nurture program. Put rest periods at the end of your program. So we've got wait periods in between each email, but after a while, what you'll want to do is rest portions of your data, right? And that will help attrition. So what you'll want to do is basically say, hey, we'll send maybe three or four emails, however, whatever dictates uh, come out of your persona buyer uh, and content map, and put a three-week wait in, put a four-week wait in, depending on how long your sales cycle. Uh, and then test. Test like crazy. Here's a great uh, uh, thing you should be able to do with, uh, with uh, automated programs. Uh, you certainly can with Acton. Create a copy of the program. It's very simple. One button. Copy this entire huge program as a new one. Change all the wait steps to this, like, 10 minutes. Drop yourself in as an email and watch yourself work through it. You'll see the emails pop through in your inbox. It's very fun. So uh, those are just a, a couple of the tips and tricks tons, uh, uh, you know, when you start using marketing automation, especially automated programs like this for nurturing, oh, 
you, you can do so much. So I want to sort of uh, steer or switch directions here. We're going to start doing some show and tell, okay? Um, and I want to start diving into the data and design part of today's presentation. It's really the two things that are coming together in ways we haven't quite seen, right, that's helping to power up so many uh, of our, our customers' revenue operations for small and medium-sized businesses, right? Um, I, I am a fan of Harvard Business Review. and It continues to be one of sort of my go-to content outposts for a really – great stuff about business and marketing. And they posted a tweet a while back, and, and the headline was using, quote, both brain marketing to balance creativity and analytics. And I thought, man, this is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, here's a quick snippet. Marketing was once largely the preserve of creative right brain types, but the function needs and is getting a much larger mixture of data and analytics. Sometimes, though, there's a danger of relying too heavily on analytics. What's needed is the right balance, what we call a both-brain approach. This is what we're talking about. It's the data and design. Something on screen here. Uh, this is a very simple linear weight, uh, send weight uh, automated program. It takes anonymous website visitors and sends them an introductory email. Very simple, right? This, uses, this relies basically 75% on data, 20% on technology, and 5% creativity. But its function is very clear. It's introduce ourselves to anonymous website visitors, and the results are great. Next one, let's keep moving along. Uh, this is uh, a new customer program. This is a very uh, uh, common automated program to put in place, especially if you're a technology company. But if you have any kind of introductory content or implementation program for your customers, these are great. It's helpful for, to introduce uh, our customer sales or tech support uh, to know when and where customers are in an automated program, if you can see down there. We actually send an alert to someone. Uh, in our company that says, hey, this prospect has reached the end of this introductory uh, automated program, right? Um, we're updating fields within our CRM. Uh, we're syncing with our CM so that it's very simple. All of the tools that our, our revenue operations team are using are benefiting from our nurturing programs. So uh, it's, again, great, great to touch base with customers uh, with. So uh, I want to kind of bring in the design portion, um, we, you know, additional, first of all, on the left, you're going to see we've added conditional behavior branching. This is very, very data-intensive stuff, but easy to get at. Um, we've added that with a responsive design email, which we'll show you some examples of uh, in a bit. And we put, and landing pages, uh, you know, responsive design landing pages, and we got a spectacular result. Um, as good marketers, we test stuff all the time, right? And... Um, we tested this, and it was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the, the yield in a second. But on the left, what you're able to do is speed up the delivery of content as your buyers show more interest in your product and show you, you know, with their digital body language, that they're ready to move on to the next step in their cycle. Uh, or you can slow them down. You know, if you're not getting any engagement, you can actually slow people down through these automated programs. So uh, we, we tested head-to-head. Earlier, uh, you know, responsive design versus non-responsive, and I'm telling you what, it blew our, blew our, blew our socks off. We saw almost a hundred percent increase in overall engagement. That's huge. That's that's some, that was a game changer for us, and we've since made the switch. Right, we're all responsive all the time, everything as best as we can. Uh, that's you know, uh, trigger emails, that's automated programs, that's everything we do. We want to make sure we're looking good on every single device uh, because it, it sort of defines who we are, that creativity side, that design side. So, all right, I want to take you through what I consider to still be a top-of-game automated nurture program. Full disclosure here, they are, of course, a member of the Acton family of clients, uh, Pump One is, and uh, I presented some of this material uh, at one of our user groups in New York City and uh, with their graphic designer. Now, think about that. It was at that moment on stage. I asked people to take a picture of us because it may be the first and last time they'd see a database marketer presenting alongside a designer. But we did, and it was great. You know, So first of all, Pump One is a lifestyle fitness company with a few applications that help provide fitness planning. Right? They're, it's a mobile device. Right? Their mission is to get you fit with one click. They have a freemium product with a 30-day trial, so their whole part is they want to convert users on the freemium 
on that trial to paying customers. So let's dig into some of the concepts they wanted to build uh, into their program. So guiding principles are very, very simple. One, people only glance at email, often just for a few seconds. So the look and the design and the feel is extremely important to effectively engage prospects. That responsive design we were talking about, it needed to work across all platforms, no matter where they were at. Basically, wherever their app was on their smartphone, on their tablet, uh, it needed to look good in the email. They're in a really competitive market space, so they had to stick out. And they knew their prospects' paths, right? Success was paying customer. Failure was, hey, maybe there's a different application they could offer you. Uh, but they ultimately wanted to take their prospects on a journey, journey excuse me, to help with their fitness goals. Right, and guide them through that trial of uh, 30 days. So the usage of behavior from inside their app w is so great, though. This is where really data and design collide and make this really powerful statement. So uh, they also needed to avoid a lot of um, terms in their emails. Think about this. Uh, they wanted to skip the spam traps. You know, If you're talking about weight loss or losing weight in a subject line, you know where that email goes, right? Uh, so... They had four programs and four personas, and ultimately this is what their, um, their, their flow looked like for the automated program. This is the actual uh, buying process, right? So they download the app, okay, and they sign up for the plus trial, right, and they get the content. It's delivered to their mobile device, and they start using it. It's free, and the timer starts. And they also start into the nurturing program, um, they either purchase the app or what they can do then at the end of the program if they haven't uh, purchased is, is send them to a, uh, another possible application or uh, a fitness app they may, may consider purchasing. Pretty simple, right? Uh, but the cool part is that it uses the behavior from inside the app. As you work out and log your workouts and do their training program, you're going to get customized messages through your trial right? They are dialed in to the data. I mean, to perfection. Um, they don't just use the data from individual fitness apps um, to make sure the next message is relevant and timely. They're using it so that it encourages them to use it more. You know, they want the app to be, app, uh, to be used. So um, two, two real simple options that you see on the screen here, right? If you watched one of the uh, classes, if you kind of engaged in it, you're going to get a message that says, hey, how was your workout? You know, congratulations, you, you did well. Or if you did not watch it, if you haven't used it yet, that first message is going to say, hey, start burning today. You know, start using the application. It's fantastic, right? So, uh, you know, it, they know that usage is a key ingredient to whether someone wants to continue to use and much less pay for it. So they want to really encourage use through this. So, Another thing I wish I could show you uh, via this uh, webinar platform, but we are a little bit uh, in, uh, just kind of limited by, by design here. Pump One relies on animated GIFs to keep interest and encourage viewership um, in a unique fashion. First, for those that aren't familiar, animated GIFs are just files that will autoplay some animation inside your email client, whether that's Outlook or Gmail or Yahoo or other, and it, it, so, first of all, there are very few email clients that can't handle animated GIFs. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, we're, we're limited with what we can show you. So I've sort of uh, 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 I'll walk you through it. If you bear with us, um, you know, what happens is at the very top of the email, um, it will look like you're pulling one of these um, uh, fitness exercises into uh, the top, and it will say, "Hey, you're creating your own unique fitness program." Right now. Ultimately, it's, it's by design. It's this design concept that all Pump One wants to do is increase the time someone spends on that email and engages in that email because they know that's the first hurdle, right? So uh, ultimately, uh, you know, while the animated GIFs are, are there, a lot of times it's just in the header and it's very subtle. It's just something that gets you to say, hmm, did that move? because you're not expecting that on your smartphone. You're not expecting that in your Gmail client. Uh, and so just by uh, that act alone, it's getting you to consume your email message further. It's a great concept. So I can't tell you how impressed I am. It's not just only you know, the responsive design, how they look, 
but how well they perform. And it makes sense, right? And we're, we're all sitting here with a small computer, either in front of us at our desk right now or it's in our pocket, right? Smartphones have reshaped the way we need to talk and communicate with our customers. But in addition to figuring out, you know, the best call to action button designs and, and, and things of that nature, we now have to think through the question of click or scroll content. Up here you see, um, you know, responsive design on the desktop. It's expanded. It's got more uh, uh, information on a wider screen. But if you switch to mobile, everything stacks to a scrollable design because that's how people use their smartphones, your iPhones, your, your, your Samsung G GS whatnots, right? So um, Pump One also, I think, does a really great job of, of putting a sense of urgency into this. So here's another design element um, that really helps to encourage and motivate uh, people to uh, use the app while it's still free. And remember, they want to encourage usage. But also, it lets them know, hey, you've got 17 days left. So when you get an email from Pump One, and the first thing that will happen is when you open it, that 17 that you see on the screen there on the left uh, um, uh, screenshot, it will actually count down to 16. Or if you're at 18, it will count down to 16. That's part of that small animated GIF that they like to introduce so that you understand it keeps you engaged with that content. Uh, uh, fun food for thought here, too. You see the, uh, the, the boxer kind of going at it at the heavy bag there. Uh, you can't see it here, but that heavy bag, sways back and forth very, very slightly, just a little bit. And it's, again, it's intended to just catch your eye and make you go, what? Did, it, did that just move? Um, they've uh, increased engagement, and they've uh, really helped um, cre uh, create a better click path or, or click uh, rate, excuse me, uh, through that. Um, but it, the, the trick here it, with the design part, don't make it overwhelming. Don't make it something that, uh, on that animated GIF, that people want to just keep looking at and just keep looking at. You want to get them just interested enough to keep going and go down and get and, and consume the, the content that's down below. So uh, I really like their use of their CTAs and buttons here, too. It's, it's all intended to promote that purchase click, you know. All the, uh, the, that last email, uh, you know, you're going to get your times up. Uh, uh, on the upper right-hand corner for the Fitness Builder Program email. Uh, and it's great, you know. So, uh, so now I'm going to step back a little bit uh, from the show and tell and walk through what I think are some technology considerations because it's great to look at this on a screen at a webinar and uh, that, that you've signed up with Lorman here and, and act on and looking at us kind of talk about it. But there's, you have to know there's technology that you need to, to, in order to execute these programs, right? So there's two sides, right? There's two sides in all of us. Uh, it's all about the data, you know, those marketers, those database marketers. No, 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 it's all about the design, you know. Well, it's got to be both. Um, but it, here's some technology considerations as you're looking to really power up your own uh, email programs and, and maybe move to those automated programs. Behavior data. Get some. Use it. It is fantastic. Knowing what somebody did previous to an email that you sent them will power your programs up beyond anything you could have ever imagined. You know, it really helps define your prospect's journey. And automated programs, you know, that technology side of it, you can do so much more with so much less time. Uh, make sure you, you have, when you step into this realm, branching logic and dynamic messages. You can't just rely on, hi, insert first name, comma, you can't just do that. That's fine, and that will get you so far. In fact, if you want something you can do next week, do this simple test. Test putting a, a prospect's um, company name in the subject line versus not. You will see an immediate increase in open rates, I promise you. But you've got to go beyond that. You've got to get branching logic, dynamic messages. And also, sync with everything. You have to be CRM agnostic uh, because that way, as marketers, you're not limited to – you know, following and scripting in and, and making sure everything fits into this off-brand CRM or maybe a homespun one. Get something that fits with everything, right? Ultimately, really help your company internally. Uh, service your prospects and customers. Get alerts. Make sure that you can alert people inside your company when somebody takes a specific action. How great would it be if you could alert your VP of sales when one of their top prospects, one of their owned prospects, hits your pricing page in real time. Do you think that makes a difference in his or her day? It will, because they're going to pick up the phone and call them. 
That's a great buying sign. And it starts with technology. Also, segment. Holy cow. You, you don't need IT to do this. The data is easy, right, if you get the right technology. So for those on the other side of the camp, though, it's all about design. You're right, too. You need a drag-and-drop composer. Look for CSS and advanced builders. Don't settle for um, clunky WYSIWYGs anymore, okay? Uh, once you go responsive, you will never look back. You will get such great response rates. Your engagement will go up, and you're going to look a lot better across all devices. You're going to love responsive. Um, also, you've got to know what it looks like before you sent it. Um, you know, and, and that has to be across multiple email platforms and mobile. And you've got to be able to see that very quickly and, and, and efficiently. Test animation. Test it. Get that animated gift. Do one. Okay? Uh, look up. There's a lot of places online that you can learn how to uh, create animated gifts. Rachel does really great animated gifts. I'll just give her a, a quick shout-out here. Um, they're really fun. They're entertaining but they help to, again, just like we're talking with Pump One, extend engagement with that content. Okay? Also, um, you got to have some templates to start out with. So look for that when you're looking for um, some design because a lot of times we all have deadlines and you need to get that email out quickly. And it can't look like the Mona Lisa every single time, but you need to come close. You need to have something that's easy, quick, and looks good. Uh, so, and also, again, Make sure you have something that you can preview those beautiful emails with uh, very quickly. Uh, it will speed up your daily process a lot. So I'm going to wrap it up. I think we're coming up on uh, probably about 45 minutes. So I will consider it a, a gift to all of us if we are able to kind of wrap this up sooner. I, I did see some questions coming in, so I'm really excited to get to those. Thanks for your patience. Um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, uh, Define that process. Get, for those of you still in the process of doing that, make that a priority. It will, like I said, it will inform all of the content you make. It will really help power up that buyer's journey that they're taking, uh, uh, and, and it will it inevitably result in more uh, revenue for your company. It is a fact, that content marketing. And, and it really just drives, uh, helps to drive that strategy side of marketing, right? Um, again, that content, match it up. Got to be talking uh, directly to uh, the right people the right way. A great example is this. You know, two of our personas at Acton, very simply, many of you are in the audience right now, marketers, right? The way that um, we talk with you in our content, the way that we write, the way that we engage with you digitally is not the same as the other, uh, another persona that we also uh, must attract and we also uh, provide and create content for, which is the small business owner. We know that small business owners are often enough the, the responsible party for putting a decision like this in place. So think about that. I'm not going to go after a small business owner talking about marketing content and marketing um, whizzy stuff, right? I'm going to talk to them about you know, global effects, the ROI, the results that they'll see from a MarTech purchase such as Acton, right? So... Um, it's very important that you, you, you slice and dice and you're able to offer content um, separately. Um, and then finally, start small, start big, whatever. Start. Lead nurturing is well worth the time, well worth the leap, uh, and using technology pays off in spades. I can't tell you enough. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over. Rachel, what do we got? I've got some really cool questions to answer. Great. Yeah, thank you, Erin. We have a ton of questions coming in, but um, now is the time. If you have not entered in a question and you're just itching to get some information, go ahead and enter in your questions now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with uh, one of the first questions that we received, and it kind of ties back into the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about buyer personas. So um, how many lead profiles do you recommend a company starts with? Is there a recommended number. Yeah, so I don't think it, it, there isn't really a recommended number. The, the the first step is to understand who who are all of the uh, uh, parties involved in a decision, right? Those are the people that you need to go after first. Now, I will tell you that while there isn't a specific number, it's always going to be different depending on which product, what kind of a service you're selling, etc. There is always going to be a better one to start with. And that's going to be the person involved or responsible with uh, what we'll call the power of the pen, right? If you have a product that needs a signature to sell, that's 
the person who is most often signing that, that's the first step you want to do. That's the first uh, persona that you'll want to create. And it's going to be the most beneficial also for sales. It really helps to uh, give them better leads through time and better prospects that they can work with. Um, there's nothing more frustrating, if anyone has ever been in sales, than getting a lead that is great, highly engaged, high-profile uh, lead score, great uh, uh, on surface, but they can't do anything. Uh, ah, yeah, I'm just kind of kicking tires. So you want to go after what I'd consider the C-suite as best as possible as, uh, as a first step. Great, yeah, and also related to that, so I know depending on how many uh, personas a company has, you, you have your different content for each, and it can be kind of daunting to develop that much content and, and customize for your personas, especially when you have a, a smaller marketing team. So do you have any tips or tricks for, for developing customized content? Yeah, the customized content um, really can be as hard as you want it to be to develop. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but it, it's true. Um, so let's take first kind of the type of content. Let's talk about a white paper, a PDF, a download. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, customizing that to a per specific persona, you're going to have to create the whole PDF document. We've got um, some articles uh, and some resources on acton.com, actonsoftware.com, you know, that speak about, you know, small business owners, decision-making processes, and so forth. Those were created with one specific persona in mind. However, there are other kinds of content, and this is the fun part that you can get in, especially email, when you move it into the digital landscape that you can serve up dynamic content with. So, and it's basically, you know, paragraph blocks. So remember earlier I was talking about, hey, we've got to get beyond the high first name. Instead of that, it's going to be, hey, so-and-so, and if your title is CEO or if you previously downloaded an, a white paper on SEO tactics, then you produce an entirely different block of content than you would someone else. So it speaks specifically to who they are or where they are at in their buying process or, quite frankly, what, just what they're interested in. And that's why you're going to see a lot more engagement. You're going to see a lot better results with an automated nurture program that includes uh, uh, the, the, the conditional branching, the conditional messaging, and the dynamic content. Great, and we do. We have a couple of questions coming in about responsive design, which I think is so important. So we're going to kind of hop into these because I know, I know, especially if I'm going to a website and it's not responsive for mobile, it's a pain to look at their website, and I leave. I completely exit. So I think it's really important that we touch on this. And um, you know, one of one of the questions that we received is, can we repeat the results of the percentage of increase that we saw? And uh, switching to responsive design, we saw a 93.5 percent increase in engagement using responsive. So a couple of the questions have been, can you tell us a little bit about the differences between responsive and non-responsive? So we'll kind of hop into that. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, Rachel, you've been a huge help in, in really helping to put the, the responsive design in, in place here at Acton. So you could speak to it as well as I. But, but ultimately, um, what we did is we took a, uh, a, an exact replica uh, email for that head-to-head that -head test. Um, and we said, hey, this is the same content. Here's the same number of um, calls to action buttons on the email and, and so forth. The one, though, when we sent it out, you would have left to right scrolling on a smart device. That's exactly what you're talking about, uh, Rachel, when you get frustrated, when it's not really easily consumed. We're spoiled now. We want everything exactly how we want it when we instantly set eyes on it. We need it perfect. Uh, well, responsive design really lines everything up. It basically says, hey, how it, it, it identifies the screen size for which the device that you're opening or consuming the content with is, right? How many pixels? And it adjusts all of the content that's in that message on that email or landing page or website, right, to fit that screen. And it basically um, knows how and when to stack certain blocks down, uh, and it will hide and show different things. It's uh, it, it very very powerful because uh, if somebody opens an email or hits a landing site or a web page of yours and they don't like it, just like you said, Rachel, they're gone, and there goes your conversion opportunity too. Great. Thank you so much, Laura, for that, for that information because we, we definitely want to get to all the questions today. So I'm, I am going to go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, and, you know, we're getting a couple of questions that uh, – 
obviously this is kind of low-hanging fruit for us because a lot of the questions that are being asked right now is, uh, are there an email marketing service that you recommend? And is there a platform that does everything that we're talking about today? And yes, there is. It is Acton. <laughs> I, yeah, so that, I saw that one come through, Rachel. Um, so Acton uh, Marketing is that platform. So not only are you getting all of the automated programs, uh, you, you know, th- with all of the whizzy stuff that we've been talking about that we use, that our customers use, we've got, uh, I think we're nearing 3,000 customers now. It, it gives you so much more. It gives you a social platform. You can create your websites and microsites. You can create forms that power up your lead gen and demand gen process. It's Acton. And so I encourage you, you know, we'll, we'll – you know, Go to actonsoftware.com uh, or act-on.com, and it'll do the same thing and learn a little bit more about it. But, yeah, I mean, it's the difference between the mail-only clients out there, and we've seen them. Those are those, uh, I'll call it $20 a month things, right, where that's your batch and blast. You have no real way to um, show the results um, uh, and, and it's marketing automation tr- in its truest sense gives you all of that, the automated programs, the social presence, uh, the lead scoring, you know, hooks into your CRM and also gives you funnel reporting and, and revenue attribution reporting that really is marketers. I mean, Rachel, we, we, we deal with this every day. We want to show how well we're doing. We love it when uh, we see a sale come through and we're able to say, oh, you know what, that was specifically because of that one white paper. And we can show that, and our C-suite can see it too. And that's, that's kind of the fun part is being able to show uh, the results. Exactly. And we actually just got a comment in that somebody does use Acton, and they're extremely happy with it. So, so thank you for being a customer. We're very happy that you joined in today and hopefully you found some new tactics. Um, and, you know, going back to kind of some of the nurturing best practices, um, we are getting a lot of questions around kind of the, the end result of, of your nurture programs. And, you know, how do you have people exit? When do you, when do you know that they're done? And um, how do you uh, – is there a best way to know when they're, they're kind of at their end of engagement? Yeah, it really, uh, I know, here it is, it's, it's that quite, it varies, it depends. Uh, you know based on a couple of things, um, and it's the behavior data. If you don't have behavior data, there's no way you can tell, right? Generally speaking, you're going to get a little bit of behavior data, and it's in a bo- what I'll call in a bottle, right, from an, an email-only platform. You're going to know if somebody clicked and opened, right? Um, but understanding Further engagement past the click and open in an email is really where you're going to be able to define, hey, are they, are they done? Are they not? Um, typically speaking, you know, if we've received absolutely no engagement, no clicks, no opens, or anything like that, uh, for a period of six to eight months, what we'll do is we'll actually put them on ice, okay? We're going to put them over in the corner. Um, we're not done with that kind of a prospect, but we certainly don't want to keep bombing them. So what we'll do is we'll just kind of put them on ice. What we'll do is you'll start to run what, what you may be uh, familiar with if you're in the B2C land is reactivation. You know, It's the same in B2B, uh, but you're basically just trying to uh, sort of offer up some content, maybe of greater value, right, to get that click, to promote that engagement. Uh, but it, it's going to depend on mostly how long your sales cycle is uh, and, and also sort of your ASP, your average sale price, because those two dynamics really uh, do uh, a lot to, to, to say, hey, is somebody unengaged for over a six-month period of time or three months period of time? It's kind of up to uh, your, your own internal wisdom. Right, and yeah, a lot of that is making sure, as Aaron mentioned, that that you are collecting that behavioral data, and then also that you're syncing with your CRM system, so you know when people have converted, you know, have purchased or have become a customer, so that you're making sure that you're providing the right messaging. And you know, one of the questions that kind of goes along with that is, are there any concerns that people feel like their privacy is being invaded with this kind of Big Brother effect because we have so much data on people? How do you kind of avoid that that creep factor? Well, uh, it, that's a great question, um, and it, we, when we face it, I mean, we're, that's a real concern of ours, right? Um, we consciously avoid, um, uh, you know, being overly specific in the messages that we send about what somebody's done, okay? Because that does get to be kind of creepy. Hey, we saw that you went on our website and hit this page, and then this page, and then w- looked at the um, landing page or uh, the the pricing page, and then downloaded this white paper content. What do you think? That's a little bit too much, right? But it, it's still a valid question, you know. Where's the line drawn? And ultimately, it's not about 
uh, telling people you know what they've done. It's using what they've done to send them another better uh, uh, piece of content. And in that respect, you know, that's where I like to sort of rest my head, which is I'm, I'm able to provide better content, more relevant content, which is, I think, more important than sort of, you know, just offering up the next, um, let, let's call it, you know, the newsletter, right? Um, I'm going to be able to say, hey, it looks like you're interested in SEO, right? So I'm going to put you on a track that's going to offer you SEO 101, some SEO um, tools, and some, something that you're very specifically interested in because it's not about really just getting that prospect to convert and to, to, to um, pull them through that funnel like we do. It's offering value, and it's offering the right value because if you can't do that within an email, within an email nurture program, then you're doing something wrong. All right, and I think we have time for about one more question today, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it back to kind of the automated programs. And, you know, one of the questions we received was, do you recommend one design over the, over, over the other as far as um, your kind of your lead scoring and your conditional versus the dynamic content branching? I'm a big fan of using data as, best, as much as possible. I mean, the more data, the better. Uh, and so I definitely skew towards um, using, uh, you know, conditional branching. Uh, which is basically, so the difference between condi conditional branching and conditional messaging is very simply this. Conditional branching will say, hey, did you do something? And if you did or did not do this or don't do that. Conditional messaging is, hey, what's your persona or what have you done? Here, send this specific message, right? And that's really where you can see uh, it, the, the, a much higher rate of engagement, you know, because you're, you're, you're definitely offering up more specific content, more relevant content through time, and that's, it just, it's a no-brainer. It really, it really does. I think one of the other uh, questions that I saw here was, you know, which sees better results, nurture or drip? Those, those nurture programs are going to uh, give you better results because they're, they're journey-focused, and as, as best as you can make that journey custom to that person, that one individual, the better your results are going to be, for sure. Great. So speaking of journey, we've come to the end of hours today. Um, so, you know, we'd like to thank everybody for taking the time out. And, you know, hopefully you found some, some tips and tricks that you can take and implement on your own today. Um, uh, as a reminder, this session has been recorded, and it is going to be sent out to everyone that attended as well as the slide deck. So you'll be able to use that for reference to kind of, you know, look back, get some tips and tricks, use it as a refresher, share it with your coworkers. Um, we want to make sure that you have all the information available to you because uh, here at Actum we're all about uh, empowering marketing teams and making, uh, making sure that you have the materials that you need to to power those big ambitions that you have. So uh, we'd like to thank you for joining, and I'd like to thank Aaron for presenting some fabulous information today because he is so passionate about this topic. Um, and, uh, you know, check us out at uh, www.act-on.com. Uh, we are available on Twitter for questions. And uh, feel free to email us, uh, reach out, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel.